Thank you. Thank you very much, Serpa. And thank you particularly to our expert speakers. Um, it's been, I'm sure, very stimulating, very informative, certainly it is for me. And I think what struck me was that it was people-centered and it's, there's no one size fits all when it comes to dementia for the individual themselves, for their carers, uh, for their practitioners. So to have people centers understand what's going on. And with that, then we can improve quality of life. And of course, the challenge is, <clears throat> How are we going to um, get that message out into our, well, to our practitioners, care practitioners, into our communities, so that we can ensure that people do remain at home with a very effective support from their carers. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to just, uh, when we have, a, as, as usual, uh, time clock is against us. Um, we have about 10 minutes for uh, Q&A discussion. Um, if anybody would like to raise any particular issue. Yes, we have a microphone as well. You might introduce yourself as well, please. Thank so you. My name is uh, Jean Georges, the director of Alzheimer Europe. So yes, big thanks to all four speakers. I realized that uh, when I invited all four of you that we would have fantastic presentations, but I've also realized now after listening to you that I actually forgot to include one perspective when talking about BPSD or neuropsychiatric symptoms, because I think the focus of all your four presentations was very much on the experience of healthcare professionals, how they can diagnose, deal, treat, and uh, manage uh, some of these symptoms. That's very much around residential care, emergency care. But what we forgot to think about is people with dementia leave at home. They have carers at home. And we're very lucky here today that we have our European Dementia Carers Working Group that is meeting here in Brussels for the first time. And we've actually forgotten to think, how can we make sure that people that are caring at home for people with agitation or aggression or other symptoms, what can we do to improve their lives before they reach the healthcare system, before there's an emergency, before they end up in hospitals or before they end up in residential care? And I was just wondering whether you had some thoughts on that. Thanks, John George. Yes, of course, very important. You're very welcome, carers. Thank you. Well, of course, it's such an important part of the ecosystem. So, Professor. You would like to give an answer? Thank you. Just a very quick, uh, hello. Uh, just a, a very quick response to that, because you're absolutely right. It's fundamental. The the only reason one would ever want to talk about BPSD, anxiety, agitation, depression, all of these things, is because they are so important and so difficult for um, people with dementia themselves, but also for their family carers. Everything that I said in my talk was about people living in their own homes, as much about them as it is people living in care homes uh, or in general hospitals and the 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 critical thing is to enable identification at an early stage supporting people within their own homes so they can stay there which is actually what the vast majority of individuals want to do and a lot of the work that um, I was showing you there uh, includes the experience of people with dementia and family carers through an attention to the quality of life of those individuals as a proper outcome within trials not just the agitation themselves so absolutely must have that that viewpoint there as well but almost universally if you go to people with dementia and the carers and carry out good quality consensus work enable them to speak this is the stuff that's really horrid this is the stuff that people want dealt with. And actually quite a lot of the other stuff, you know, you don't mind so much. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of those, uh, a lot of the 44 trials that I that I put up there quickly were about carer interventions in order to help people to venture. Got to think about it being dyadic, uh, either in care homes or, or particularly in their own homes. And so there are th the, the quality of life of people with dementia and their carers is fundamentally um, is fundamentally related. So you can intervene in the carer to help the person with dementia, you can intervene in the person with dementia to help the carer, and you can also do things for both that make the quality of life of either of them much worse indeed. And I think that you need to avoid doing those things that gives you the lose-lose rather than the win-win. Mm. Very good, yeah. Jacqueline, yeah, you wanted to? Uh-huh. <laughs> Yes, because I, I was talking about the project for people living at home with dementia, and I have to agree that the role of the informal carer didn't come that much on the foreground. 
but in the Netherlands, we strive to give a case manager to every person diagnosed with dementia from the diagnosis or rather around diagnosis and then on. So in principle, even from an early stage of dementia, so from diagnosis, there would be a case manager, ideally. It, it doesn't work everywhere. I have to admit that, Mathieu. Who would have knowledge about uh, behavior, symptoms, and things like that? So that, uh, but and as there wasn't time for me to tell that, they also make uh, leaflets for informal carers to tell something about uh, behavior and how to deal with that and mm -hmm. prevent trouble. So okay, yeah, we have and Norway the experience you mentioned and yeah. So, you have another question here? Um, it's partly a comment and partly a follow-up question. So I'm Mary Frances Morris. I'm a trustee of Alzheimer Scotland and a new trustee of Alzheimer Europe. Um, I cared for both my parents who both suffered from or lived with dementia sequentially for over 10 years. I cared for them very closely. And the I absolutely agree with Professor Banerjee that the neuropsychiatric symptoms are key to quality of life, absolutely. Um, I noticed, you know, it's almost like two case studies over a decade long, and I noticed that the, the quality of care was absolutely essential. Both of my parents stayed at home, and I was there most of the time when things got tough. I went up and down from London every week. Some days I was there two days out of the week, some Sometimes I was there for weeks at a time. But often it was poor training for the carers. Often it was the care agencies who'd been employed by social services departments who were skimping on training in order to cut, cut the margins, profit margins, to increase the profit margins, I should say, so that they made the most possible profit. And so... I wonder what people think. Do, do people agree that really we have to change attitudes at government level, that we do not accept care agencies onto social services books if they don't implement proper training strategies and they don't use evidence-based approaches such as the ones that we've heard today? Is that something that people agree with? Do you have any experience, any of our speakers, somebody here as well? on that subject. My name is Paddy Crosby. I'm Paddy. One, one of the new carers group and I cared for my husband, Derek, who was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's when he was 58. He died a year ago last November. And it's it's very interesting to follow up what you were talking about. We in the working group in um, Dublin, look of, of carers are pushing the idea that home care that's delivered in the home should be very much centered around the person and the carers trained around uh, caring for people with dementia because it makes a huge difference. I was very lucky. One of the carers that I got on board to help us, he had an experience of looking after people with dementia and the difference he made to the quality of my life and the quality of Derek's life was enormous because he wasn't specific about task orientation. It was very much about this, a, this the social element and stimulation of his brain doing things that he knew Derek was interested in and getting him involved and do that. And I do believe that we should be taking a stand and saying, if care is to be provided in the home for people with dementia, it needs to be specifically trained to on, on the needs of people with dementia so that you're not standing at the door, meeting a care and saying, this is what you need yes. to do. And it was interesting when you were looking through your slides about the things that you look for before you go down to a medicated medicated response as a carer you learn very quickly your checklist to go through of what could be causing the agitation or the aggressive behavior and it's you you learn it very quickly as anybody who's a carer will tell you that checklist is there so if we could push that kind of thing it is wonderful to see that level of, of research and work going on in those different types of projects and that what is particularly heartening is that they are so specific to the person and to the care of the person. Exactly. So we just hope that it can be mainstreamed in the long Thanks. run. Okay, Thank you. yeah. Thank you. That's it. That's interesting. Yeah. The care, caring or training of the carers, I think it would be probably and that it came out as, as well in the in the presentations. 
We know what to do, but it's a matter of making sure that it permeates right through into our communities and our homes. You did another question here or a comment? Yep. My name's Jane Goodrick, and um, I'm married to Chris Roberts, who's the chair of the Working Group of People with Dementia. Mm -hmm. And I fully agree with everything that's been said. It's fantastic to hear it. It was fantastic to hear it four years ago, five years ago, six years ago. As okay. Derek's husband has just said, it's down to training, but it's not just training us. Um, in the UK, we have we do have a, a charity based in um, based in the UK called Dementia Carers Count, which upskills carers in the role of caring. Mm. It's not support; it's to upskill us in that role of caring, so that we recognise the triggers, so that we can be proactive. All this is reactive. Um, a lot of uh, what Professor Banerjee was saying is still reactive because by the time they go to to uh, a a medical professional we're already at crisis point yes. we need to upskill the staff the medics the nurses in recognizing these things in being proactive in not letting us get to crisis point because once we get to crisis point it's you've got late. two of us to look after you've got somebody that's probably and this is personal experience from a peer of mine three o'clock on a friday afternoon social worker goes off Duty social worker comes on at six o'clock. Those three hours in between, they went into crisis. She was hospitalized. He was hospitalized. He never came out antipsychotic and then ultimately died through aspiration because he was unable to swallow because of the medication. Nobody's fault. Everybody was doing their best. But if they're doing their best in ignorance, we need to get the nurses, the doctors, the GPs at training level. Their training in dementia is scant. Um, I know um, where, where Subi works, you do an awful lot of work, our university do an awful lot of work, but until we can train the professionals who are there to support us, how are we going to be able to say, actually, no, I think that's wrong, until we've been through a crisis, until we've been shown what's wrong, yeah. then how do we know to correct it? Chris was almost um, di um, prescribed metazapine recently. He was described it about five years ago. He became very, mm -hmm. shall I say, I thought he'd gone into late stages. We managed to change that medication because I lost confidence with the prescribing um, doctor. And then the, the, the medication was changed. And I got Chris back and I've had a fantastic extra five years because of that. When they went to describe it, prescribe it recently, I said, absolutely not. And luckily, the, this new uh, doctor was very good. But until the doctors and the nurses, the medics, and the care home staff, the um, social services staff are trained, you're going to keep having us in crisis and dealing with two or more people instead of preempting, preempting the problem and giving us that extra year before, may, you know, we may well go into crisis then, but we need to be proactive, not reactive. Thank you. Yes, yeah, you say, actually, identify and take the truth. Um, I think we're, yeah. oh, you're going to... Would you like to? Uh, short response. I, I totally agree of that uh, proactive. Um, in Norway, we have a project because it has to be put into system. That's my main uh, message today, because it will be um, random who got the good care and who got, if it's not a part of the system, if it's a part of the knowledge to each carer. So that's very important. We have a pro project in Norway now that we try to identify the most um, frail. Uh, and uh, give them uh, a special to try to support, to try to anticipate when things may be going to happen. If the spouse are going to the planned hospital stay, for example, or they are moving a flat or the dog died or whatever. So we have some triggers that we know may give challenges. And is it possible to be proactive? Thank you. Okay, great, very good. Look, um, we've actually, uh, we're up against the clock here, I'm sorry, but I know our speakers and everybody is going to be hanging around over coffee and opportunity to to engage as well and to discuss further on that. Um, but I, I mean, it's been most interesting from my point of, point of view, absolutely support the carers and, and so, so such a practical, a practical presentations today, of course, it makes so much sense, but we need to implement it in our communities. Um, so I'm on behalf of, well, Alzheimer's Europe, thank you 
for organizing. Thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you to my fellow MEPs. I see Christoph Hansen here, Peter Lisi was here. And if I'm missing anybody that I don't recognize, maybe they might put up their hand, members of the European Parliament. Very happy, I know, not happy, to, but feel, know that this is so important to support um, Alzheimer's Europe and the work they're doing and highlighting the issues around living with Alzheimer's, living with dementia, the whole uh, ecosystem, because um, it is one of the greatest challenges as we grow older. It's going, it is one of the greatest challenges for, for all of us. And we need uh, to, to recognize as best practice and keeping, keeping our solutions and our supports people-centered. So thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions, particularly to our speakers. And we really look forward to uh, engaging again in this very important topic. Garmila Mahogriff, thank you.